Witness the beginning of the end for DC's stretchiest crook turned hero when a blast from a death ray slowly starts melting Plastic Man one molecule at a time. Will his terminal condition be taken seriously? And will his son meet the same fate? Let's find out in our review of Plastic Man No More number one from DC Comics. See you in three. Welcome back to Comical Opinions. This is our review of Plastic Man No More number one. I'm just gonna say it right out. Plastic Man No More number one is strangely troubling. At a glance, the concept is straightforward and potentially interesting. But what throws the whole issue off balance is the tonal conflict. You can have a serious drama with moments of well-timed levity, or you can have a comedy with some emotional depth. There's nothing wrong with that. But when you smash those two tones together against each other, the result is a comic that feels weirdly off-putting. All right, so let's dig in. Plastic Man No More Number 1 begins with a brief prologue that shows how Patrick Eel O'Brien, in his former life as a low-level robber and crook, became Plastic Man. After years in and out of incarceration, he gained stretchy powers after falling into a vat of chemicals during a late-night robbery. The accident also prompted Eel to turn over a new leaf and use his newfound powers to become the crime fighter known as Plastic Man. Writer Christopher Cantwell begins the issue on a canonically consistent note with a little character work to boot. The first scene involving a jewelry store robbery shows Eel is a criminal with a priority problem, which plays a part in some of his personal problems that occur several years later. Now we're in the present, Plastic Man fights alongside the Justice League against Solaris. The villain takes aim at an orphanage with a death ray built with alien technology. So Plastic Man steps in to take the full brunt of the blast to save the orphans. Plastic Man saves the day, but the effects of the death ray linger long after he goes home to sleep off the fight. The beginning of the issue is a little bit on the grim side. Now, Christopher Cantwell continues that grim depiction of Plastic Man by showing him in an unkempt, darkened apartment with piling up bills. Plastic Man's girlfriend, Angel, and son, Luke, are nowhere to be found, confirming Plastic Man's personal life and finances are pretty much in shambles. Later, when Plastic Man wakes up, he notices his right hand and arm are dripping away from him like melted candle wax into a nearby tub drain. He can't get his arm to reform, so he gathers up the gooey material inside a plastic bag, ties the bag to his arm, and heads to the Justice League headquarters for help. When Plastic Man shows the leaguers what's happening, they talk over him and laugh at his silliness. Later, Detective Chimp pulls Plastic Man aside to explain that he talked with Batman privately about the seriousness of the situation, and Batman suggests Plastic Man seek out Dr. Vera Menlo, a chemist who might be able to help. So now here's where we see that tonal conflict hitting home in a very big way. Plastic Man contacts the Justice League for help after he appears to be literally falling apart as a result of Solaris's attack. Rather than offering help or showing the slightest bit of sympathy, they laugh at him and turn their back as if, as if he wasn't there. Could you in your wildest imagination picture Wonder Woman not showing the smallest bit of empathy for somebody who's hurt? Does it make the slightest bit of sense for Superman to be laughing at another hero's pain? Can you picture Batman laughing at all in a casual setting? No, of course not. It doesn't make any sense. But for some reason, Cantwell just puts it in there like it somehow makes sense in this situation. Before you get too excited, sure, yes, Cantwell is setting it up so that the Justice League wouldn't simply swoop in to save Plastic Man, ending the story in half an issue. I mean, what would be the point? But you've got to make it believable. Not only is the League's reaction not believable, but it's also presented as it's if some kind of cartoonishly funny bit like Charlie Brown getting mocked for botching a pitch at a baseball game, which doesn't match the serious tone of every other scene that came before it. Later again, Plastic Man seeks out Dr. Vero Menlo for help based on Batman's suggestion. After a series of tests, she determines he's coming apart, and there's no known cure, unfortunately, because he's one of a kind. His melting could be a result of the death ray blast, but she also states that it could be the natural outcome of his life since the accident that gave him powers. Melting could just be the way a plastic man dies of natural causes, but his condition, according to her, is terminal. Feeling a little bit depressed and despondent, but also feeling something for his son, Luke, Plastic Man reaches out to his adult estranged son to deliver the bad news and urge Luke to get checked out by Dr. Menlo since Luke was born with the same powers as his father. The meeting doesn't end well, since Luke isn't interested in taking caring advice from the father who abandoned him, and there's a quick montage scene that shows how Plastic Man walked out on Angel and his son when things were difficult. It doesn't exactly explain why, but yeah, that does happen in this comic. The issue concludes with Plastic Man reaching out to Dr. Menlo again to consider some more extreme measures. 
So she comes up with what we'll call the nuclear option. So that's the issue, at least the first one of this four-part mini-series. Let's talk about positives and negatives, starting with what do we think was good or even great about Plastic Man No More Number 1. Just at a high level, more Plastic Man is good. He's one of those quirky heroes who has and still can embark on many exciting, fun adventures. Further, Christopher Cantwell's emotional moments in this issue, such as Plastic Man's painful meeting with his son, are impactful and authentic. Further still, the premise is interesting. Sure, we've seen stories about dying superheroes before, that's nothing new, but this is the first for Plastic Man, so the concept is sound. How would the sort of like oddball, goofy hero character handle his impending death? That's worth exploring. So let's switch to the negatives and what's not great about Plastic Man No More Number 1. There are two sore spots that really stick out as, in my mind, head scratchers. First, as we already mentioned, the tonal inconsistency is a killer. The issue waffles from serious to very light to startling to uncharacteristically jokey to deeply serious. Again, you can have a story that's dramatic with some comedic themes in there or a comedy with some dramatic moments, that's fine, but they have to be timed to work together and they have to be consistent with the characters. Cantwell stumbles on the timing and the characters all in this issue, and that's a bummer. The second sore spot is the cliffhanger. It sort of makes sense, but it doesn't th completely make sense, and you have to think about it a little bit. If Dr. Menlo had an idea about how to fix Plastic Man's condition, why didn't she offer it up in the first meeting instead of sending him on his way thinking he was about to die? Given the what we'll call nuclear nature of the solution, why wouldn't Plastic Man reach out to any number of atomic energy-based heroes on the Justice League for help? I have it on really good authority that Firestorm is not doing anything right now. He could probably use a little mission or two to kind of get him going. So it's a strong cliffhanger in and of itself, but when you think about the broader context in which it occurs, it kind of doesn't work out too well. All right, so let's switch gears and talk about the art. The art from Alex Linz and Jacob Edgar is likewise kind of strange. During the scenes with the Justice League, Jacob Edgar steps in to present a light, bright, glowing, happy version of the League with figure work that's somewhat similar to Darwin Quick's Justice League Nuke Frontier. When the story shifts back over to Alex Linz, the style is dark and the aesthetic is grim, which is completely different. There's no real strong rhyme or reason for the artistic style changes other than we wanted to show the Justice League in a different style, which is uh, okay, I guess, but it's very odd and it doesn't flow well at all, very much like the tones of the story. So final thoughts, what do we think about Plastic Man No More, number one? In general, it's a strange comic. Christopher Cantwell's central premise about Plastic Man dying has merit, and there are some deeply impactful moments of emotional drama in here, which is good. However, the serious tone is almost scuttled by scenes of nearly cartoonish comedy that don't fit the serious nature of the plot or the characters that are involved in the bit. Likewise, the art is totally off-kilter with two artists who change styles for no apparent reason. Therefore, Plastic Man No More number 1 earns a 6 out of 10. I'm always up for more Plastic Man, but the execution here is unsettling to say the least. But what do you think? Is Plastic Man high on your must-have list? Leave a thumbs up if he is, and leave a comment below with which other DC character deserves a miniseries and more love from DC Editorial. Also remember to click on the link in the description to read the written review and buy this comic to help support the channel. That would be greatly appreciated. So thank you very much for joining, and stay tuned through the outro for more reviews just like this one.